Hello, everyone. This is Hannah Polkowski at Cytobank. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to get our webinar started. Um, we are going to, today we are going to talk about exploring and identifying potentially hidden cell populations using this tool called Cytocluster, which was developed in combination with the Cytobank API. Our agenda for today is I'm going to provide brief background uh, about Cytobank and sort of set the stage for our guest speakers today. Uh, Dr. Sharam Kordasti is going to provide us the background on sort of the impetus for developing Cytocluster and explanation for um, how it was used in their study to identify and explore rare cell subsets. And this will be followed by a demonstration of Cytocluster by Thanos Marikis. And then we'll have time to answer your questions live. A bit of housekeeping throughout the webinar, please feel free to um, submit your questions using the Q&A button. We will be monitoring that uh, to answer during our live Q&A. Uh, please use that instead of the chat. Uh, we won't be monitoring the chat uh, for your questions. So for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar or newer to Cytobank, Cytobank is a cloud-based platform. Uh, comprised of a suite or a variety of high-dimensional analysis tools that we're going to be talking about a few of those today, as well as various uh, content management components. And the idea is that you can use these tools and uh, both high-dimensional analysis tools and content management tools to, you know, log into our platform using your browser from anywhere and, uh, you know, work with your data and interact with it um, seamlessly. Um, from anywhere and potentially collaborate with colleagues globally as well. We also, and um, kind of my role at Cytobank, is um, managing our informatics consulting services. So we have a lot of free support um, materials as well, and I'll share some of those resources later. Um, but for those of you who are in this presentation and thinking, wow, this is really interesting, I think I need a little more help, we also have a consulting services where we can work with you on custom projects. So the meal today and what we're talking about is um, you know, we're going to be talking more about the bottom portion of this uh, data analysis workflow. And as you can see, this, this uh, la later part is more of a, a cycle. So we're going to be talking about um, where Cytocluster fits into that. Um, but just know that Cytobank has a variety of different tools that can help with this entire workflow. And so you know, for this example today, um, both Shram and Thanos are going to provide some background on sort of their scientific uh, goals, their particular experiment setup, um, but we're not going to be getting into the details of that, nor are we going to talk more about the second piece where you may actually need to clean up your data, tidy, QC, those things. Um, the focus of today is more this next section here is uh, exploratory data analysis. So, how can you look for any potential patterns in your data that you might want to follow up with statistical analyses? And then actually, you know, how do you partition your data, identify different cell subsets that you want to then take into significance testing? And then, of course, visualizations to communicate potentially interesting or notable results. And so we're going to be talking about how Cytocluster in combination with Spade is going to help with this piece here, how going to identify different cell subsets, and then also allow you to, um, in combination with other tools such as Disney and Cytobank, really explore these populations that are identified further using, you know, Disney, as well as you'll see some clustered heat maps. So this slide here shows a lot of um, other tools that are available in Cytobank that you can piece together to customize your particular analysis pipeline or workflow depending on your analysis needs. Um, we're not going to be talking about these today, but just know that they're available. Uh, the ones we will talk a little bit more uh, in detail is Spade uh, for clustering and how that works with Cytocluster. Uh, we'll briefly talk about Disney and how that helps with some exploratory data analysis. And then I'll also share, um, you know, Cytocluster was developed in conjunction using the Cytobank API. So we'll talk a little bit about some resources for those of you who are data scientists or bioinformaticians. 
So the example for today is from uh, this 2016 blood paper by Cordasti and colleagues. And just to share a little bit more background, but um, this was from, this is a figure from their study. And this is showing how VISI was used as this quick exploratory data analysis tool to look for differences in these three different cohorts. So here we're looking at healthy donor, um, aplastic anemia patients that are not responding to immunosuppressive therapy, and that those that are responding to immunosuppressive therapy. And as we'll share a little bit later, it was really, they ended up identifying these two different Treg subpopulations that um, the difference in their abundance was predictive of whether they responded or not. So they used VISNI as a tool to explore their data, noted this interesting result, and then followed up on it. So they used uh, Bisney and Cytobank to do this, and the, one of the advantages of doing that is the fact that Bisney is in the cloud, and so this is going to allow um, you to fine-tune your different parameters to uh, get the visualization that's appropriate for your data. So here we're looking at one of the parameters you can adjust for Bisney, which is perplexity, and you can see uh, the perplexity is increasing in these columns here. And as the perplexity is increased, you can see that the sort of islands that are probably representing biologically unique or distinct uh, groups of cells are being kind of pulled apart as you're adjusting perplexity. And so, you know, how perplexity, what number is needed for your data is going to depend on uh, a lot of different factors, number of cells, uh, clustering channels. Um, but because Cytobank is in the cloud, you can adjust those and run different setups simultaneously until you find a visualization that works for your data. So the next part, as we saw from our workflow, is, okay, after we've maybe done some exploratory data analysis, or maybe we want to identify cell populations and do some more exploratory data analysis. Um, and one way to, one tool to do uh, this next step, clustering, is Spade. And so the advantage of using Spade is that Spade is going to combine all of your samples uh, that you're looking interested in uh, partitioning, and it's going to identify groups or uh, populations of cells based off of marker expression. The way that it does, it does this, it's going to use the co-expression of whatever markers you uh, tell Spade to use to partition your cells, um, which is the advantage of this is that it doesn't require any knowledge of cell identity to do this. So, um, you know, if you don't know what cells are present, you can say, okay, I've measured all of these cells. I want to tell the algorithm, partition my data uh, using these markers I've measured. And because of this, it's also going to assign each cell into a particular node. So this is the spade tree. Each circle is a node. And every cell that has been measured in all of your samples is going to be in one of these nodes. So you're not missing any cells. They're falling somewhere on your map. So this is um, really great, as you can see. But um, you know, there are a lot of nodes looking at this particular spade tree here. I think there's 200 or so. Um, and so really, the, the challenge then is you know, there probably aren't 200 biologically distinct cell subsets in your data. And so the objective is wanting to be able to partition this tree into different metaclusters or spade bubbles that are then going to correspond to biologically distinct cell subsets that you can then you know, further perform exploratory data analysis or interrogate um, further. This is where cytocluster comes in. And so you're going to see how that works, what this looks like, and we'll get into the details of cytocluster today. So before we kind of go into cytocluster, I just want to make mention that, um, you know, this tool is going to be interacting, and you'll see with Cytobank, and you'll see how, how that works uh, in a few minutes. And the reason this interaction is possible is with the Cytobank API. So for those of you, as you're watching this and thinking about, you know, what else can you do, um, you know, the Cytobank API is here for you guys to use your custom tools or interact with your data as necessary. So, um, you know, some examples might be if you want to pull in things from an electronic lab notebook, you can use the API and develop scripts to do that. 
We also have a variety of resources available as you are developing your custom tools. And so here are a few on this slide uh, to make note of. So really today, what we're going to now get into the details of is showing you how this bottom part of this machine learning workflow for single cell data analysis and how this group uh, customized it for their needs using Cytocluster and the Cytobank API. So before I introduce our guest speakers, I just want to make note of a few resources. Um, you can sign up for a free trial on premium. Uh, we also have a support portal. So if you have questions using Cytobank or you know you heard about something today but you want some more details, we have a lot of support literature in that portal as well. So please feel free to visit that. We also have a YouTube channel where we will be actually, uh, we're recording this webinar and we will put the recording on that channel later. And then for those of you who need a little more help, um, we also have uh, services division uh, where you know, we have paid consulting services and we can work with you uh, to customize or build your own data analysis workflows. And with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers today. Both of them are joining us from London. Uh, physician scientist, Dr. Shram Kordasti. He is a senior lecturer and group leader in applied cancer immunopathology at the Comprehensive Cancer Center in King's College and Guy's Hospital. And bioinformatician, Thanos Mariki from the Cancer Genome Evolution Group at Cancer Research UK, Lung Cancer Center of Excellence in University College London. They are now going to share their story behind developing Cytocluster, which is the cell clustering and exploratory data analysis tool, and provide a demonstration for how to apply this tool. Okay, hello everyone. This is Sharon Kordasti um, from King's College London. And today we're gonna have a webinar about finding T-regs in uh, an example of healthy donor as well as a uh, patient. Uh, I'll do this webinar jointly with uh, Tanis, uh, the bioinformatician who's working with us. Uh, so what I'm going to talk is about Tregs. And the first question is why Tregs and why, why we think Tregs are important. Obviously, they are important in the pathogenesis of many diseases like autoimmune diseases. Uh, they facilitate cancer progression. Uh, they can expand uh, for therapy, can be expanded for therapy, or we can target them potentially uh, to uh, prevent immunosuppression that could be due to cancer. The problem with T-Rex, however, is uh, it's not easy to identify. And there are some controversy about the subpopulations of T-Rex. Uh, but before we discuss these last two points, I want to show you an example why the T-Regs are important. Uh, in past few years, I've been working on a disease called aplastic anemia. And aplastic anemia is a autoimmune response against uh, uh, cells that are in the bone marrow, we call them stem progenitor cells. And these patients come to us with a very severe anemia and they cannot produce enough cells, uh, progenitor cells uh, in their bone marrow, and basically the bone marrow is empty. Sometimes they need bone marrow transplants, but uh, some patients, about 70% of them, they respond to immunosuppression. Uh, the issue, however, is uh, these patients, we don't know whether uh, they're going to respond to immunosuppression or not, and to uh, do some kind of prediction, uh, regulation Regulatory T cells uh, can help us. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details because it's not the subject of today's uh, webinar, but generally they have more uh, T helper 1 cells, and uh, T regs are missing in this patient almost, and the more severe disease, lower number of T regs uh, you can see in these patients. And of course, TH17s are also increased uh, in these patients. So they have a very uh, uh, autoimmune picture and inflammatory response in these patients. Uh, the problem with Tregs is 
definition of TREG is mainly based on manual gating or what we call it expert gating. The question is, what if the experts are wrong? Or if they are not wrong, they are not similar in terms of identifying TREGs. Uh, the issue with this expert gating, what we call it, is hard to reproduce, it's very subjective, and when you have a large panel of markers, uh, it's inefficient. And human basically cannot explore data spaces when you have such a multidimensional data. And if you can do all of that, it's very time consuming when you have large experiments. And in addition to that, we may sometimes be missing important discoveries or subset of cells that are not uh, really uh, within the uh, conventional definition of your uh, population, for instance, T-Rex. And if you do two-dimensional gating, uh, the co-expression of marker is not taken into consideration, uh, and therefore the functional marker uh, can be treated separately, and the cell identity is not comprehensive enough. To give you an example, uh, when I wanted to define T-Rex, I wanted to see whether actually what we call expert gating works. I asked three experts in the field of regulatory T-cells to manually gate uh, CD3, CD4 positive cells. It was good, more or less, they gave us a uh, similar gating. When it came to uh, and these are three examples, healthy donor patients with aplastic anemia that they didn't respond to immunosuppression uh, and the patient will respond. And then we asked them to identify a T-Rex, CD425 high. The definition of when we call it CD25 high is very different between these three experts. None of them are particularly wrong, but the definition is different. And when you go to, for instance, FOXP3127 low, is more or less uh, same difference as you can see here. And not only the place that define the population, where you place your gate and the percentage of positive cells, also the, uh, if you like, the uh, how tight the expression is or interquartile range, also difference between the population, which is important for the definition of population. And based on this definition, uh, you can see that between the three experts, uh, we have a range of uh, T-rigs and for a population that normally is two, three percent of your uh, cells, uh, this range uh, may not be acceptable. And uh, it makes it very difficult to compare between the studies or between the centers. And of course, when it comes to subpopulation of T-Rex based on what, uh, for instance, Sokoguchi uh, defined for the first time, we call it T-Rex 1, 2, 3. Uh, again, it's very, very difficult to judge this gating and really are we put this gate in the right place or not? Or what if we go one millimeter to right or left? It gives us different numbers. So. Although in, in the same study, uh, when you compare pre and post therapy, or when you do culture and compare pre and post culture, it's okay. But when it comes to a uh, large uh, cohort of patients between multi-center studies, then it makes it very difficult to compare. So uh, what we started doing is using mass cytometry or CITOF to identify T-Rex. This is a slide by my colleague, uh, Dr. Ellis, that uh, in a, uh, another webinar that we had before about uh, with more details about aplastic anemia, uh, we explained this, but uh, basically there are uh, two main steps for the staining and uh, using cyto for identifying regulatory T cells. So we use surface markers of the DNA and uh, uh, identifying viable cells, uh, and then intracellular for FOXP3 positive. There are some technical um, hints about how to use FOXP3 uh, staining for uh, mass cytometry that I can refer you to 
our previous webinar that uh, Richard explained uh, uh, more, with more detail how to do that. Uh, initial gating, of course, is similar, but uh, then the following steps are uh, quite different. Uh, we usually use uh, two monoclonal antibodies against SUD25 uh, to have better staining and then uh, three different clones for FOXP3. Uh, the pipeline we use for uh, data analysis is a combination of uh, dimension, uh, gating data and quality control, of course, is the first step. Then reduction of uh, dimensionality uh, reduction, which we use Visni uh, and visualize it. And then uh, subsequently uh, we use SPATE uh, based on TISNI for clustering. Of course, you can use other clustering method. It doesn't need to be SPATE. Uh, any other clustering can be used here. And then uh, using a clustered heat map to identify a specific population. And basically, we developed a package that you're going to see uh, in a couple of minutes how we can identify population from several cluster of cells that you identify by site of. Uh, this is an example of uh, Wisni, the first step that you want to visualize T Rex. You can see the population of CD25 positive, which are FOXP3 positive and 127 low. If you look at then on the density plot, uh, you can see these T-regs are actually two population. We call them T-reg A and B, it's just a name we gave, and uh, it's different between healthy donor and patients. In uh, a healthy donor, usually majority of T-regs are T-reg B, whereas in patients, you can have different ratio of TREG A and B, which correlate with uh, likelihood uh, of response to immunosuppression or in other diseases like malignancies correlate with uh, disease progression. And here you can see that uh, in aplastic anemia, at time of diagnosis, those patients who are uh, unlikely to respond to therapy, they have a almost 50-50 uh, sorry, majority of T-regs are about 7% about are T-reg A, whereas in responder you have about 50-50% uh, of T-reg A and B, and you can see significantly different between responder and non-responder. Uh, and the other aspect of this approach to identifying T-reg is this T-reg population 3, which as you know is quite uh, uh, controversial. Some people believe that is not just one population, there are uh, multiple different subpopulations within population three. And what we have noticed is majority of these T-Reg3 are uh, uh, clustering with population two, uh, sorry, with uh, uh, T-Reg B. And the rest of those T-Regs are actually outside of T-Reg area and most likely to be uh, different cells are not necessarily regulatory T cells. Uh, we, we continue this work and we identified uh, what are these cells. Hopefully, we, we published this data, but in, in, in very uh, quickly just mention it is that uh, most of these cells are not T Rex. And of course, the minimum markers that you need to use to define these two populations are here that you can see they are quite different between T-Reg A and B. Uh, there are other differences between these two, but these are the minimum markers that you need to define these uh, two populations. And actually you can uh, use uh, conventional flow cytometry and use this panel and identify these two populations of T-Regs. And of course, when you come to spade, uh, you can see the population of uh, regulatory T cells that are here. They are 25 high, uh, 1 to 7 low, and FOXP3 uh, positive. But the problem is, when we, for instance, when you look at the FOXP3, uh, first of all, you have in other places some FOXP3 because FOXP3 is not necessarily in human uh, marker for T rates. You can see on other uh, CD4 T cells or some CD8. Uh, and sometimes there are nodes like this one that makes it a bit difficult 
to actually uh, decide whether these cells are T-regs or not. They are very close to the rest of T-regs. Uh, they are 1 to 7 low, intermediate 25. Are they actually T-regs or not? And uh, they express slightly less than the rest, but are these T-regs or not is something that makes it a bit difficult and again subjective to define T-regs. So, uh, now I hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Tanis, who's going to uh, show how we use this package called Cytocluster to identify these uh, regulatory T cells and uh, make it less subjective and more robust. And over to Tanis. All right, so hello. To continue from what Saram just explained, I will very quickly go to um, Cytobank. Okay, so Saram already talked in uh, his last slide about the spade tree that we will be uh, exploring using Cytocluster. Just to start off, uh, Cytocluster is an application that was developed in NAR using Sine Framework and Cytobank's API. Uh, that we will be uh, going through it in a second. Um, the input data is, uh, for this particular demo, we use cluster data from Spade and Cytobank, but as Ram already mentioned, it can be any other clustering algorithm uh, for uh, side of data. Uh, so we have, in this particular example, we have three patient, uh, patients. One is healthy donor, one is responder, and the other one is non-responder to immunosuppression uh, therapy. And as we can see here, so this is the example for healthy donor. Uh, we have um, CD, we are setting the objectives for the demo. I forgot to mention in the beginning, it, there are two. Uh, the first one is to identify T-Rex and subpopulation of T-Rex, so T-Rex A and T-Rex B in particular, which is what Saram just showed you in the, um, in the presentation. And then going one uh, step further, we want to um, compare between, uh, across the three patients, what happens with other nodes or other subpopulation of cells and how we can explore differences um, across different spade nodes in the expression of multiple markers, not by looking one by one, but seeing the whole uh, picture in the population heat map. Uh, so going back to our example, um, we are searching for um, T-Rex, that's the first objective. And as we can see here, if I color the spay tree for CD25, the CD25 uh, high nodes are located in here. Uh, so those are most probably our T-Rex. Um, going to CD127, those are also low. And to Fox P3, those are high. Uh, so we know that more or less those are our T-Rex. The problem arises as Saram again mentioned that uh, we have other patients that if you look at these particular nodes, we have intermediate expression, so we don't know where exactly we should allocate these nodes. Um, are they T-Rex, are they T-Reg A, T-Reg B? So um, that was the reason why we developed uh, the application, which is called Cytocluster. You can load it through R, and there are mainly three steps in the workflow using Cytocluster. The first one is the retrieval of the data. Uh, for this particular demo, we use uh, Cytobank's API, but you can also uh, load your own data uh, in this tab here, which says manual input mode. Uh, and then the second step is the selection of the main group. For this particular example, again, we have three groups, healthy donors, uh, responders and non-responders to immunosuppression therapy, and then the final part is the node identification, uh, and eventually Cytocluster gives to the users the opportunity to push back the space bub the spade uh, bubbles to Cytobank and actually observe them in the spade tree that we were just looking uh, from within Cytobank. So let's log in to start our workflow in the demo. So there are two options to um, log in inside a cluster. The first one is using your credentials, so username, password, and then the particular 
uh, emerge the particular side of one side that you're using or mirror. The second one is uh, the second option to option to log in is using an authentication token, and then again the side of one side. So this can log you in without the need to uh, use username or password. So by pressing the login. So by pressing the login, the first screen that the users see uh, inside the cluster is basically uh, a selection screen for the experiment that you want to analyze. There's a drop down menu for uh, this demo. We will be using uh, an experiment from Surrounds Lab uh, that we have created particularly for, um, for this application today. Um, and as soon as the users have selected the experiment, the first part is to retrieve from Cyberbank using Cyberbank's API all the spade analysis that you have in your experiment. Of course, you can have more than one. Uh, here we have one, and the important bit here is uh, we select which one we want to analyze by clicking the big uh, box here. So by pressing the get statistics tables, what uh, Cyber clusters it, um, is doing is basically conducting Cyberbank and eventually retrieve, download, and unzip uh, all the files from Cyberbank for this particular spade run. As you can see here, it retrieved the three groups. We have one file, so one patient for each group. Uh, and of course, we can pick a subset of these groups. Uh, here, we pick all three to analyze them and eventually to compare across different conditions. Uh, Cytocluster gives gives also the option to um, perform a, a market cleaning. For that, we need uh, a file. So, just to summarize what this bit does um, in spade runs within Cytobank, what you have as your markers, the names of the markers are basically your channels. Uh, so, we wanted, as we started implementing high throughput analysis of downstream data and eventually try to interpret them. We wanted a quick and easy step to clean the market names. So that's why we've implemented a step which users can give uh, a file like that one. So there are mainly two columns in this file. The first one is your channel. We call it row. And then the second one is called market, which is basically the name of the market that you want to give to your channel. And uh, this has to do your particular experiment. You can retrieve that very easily this association very easily from uh, from side of bank. So um, in order to to clean um, the uh, the market names, we can input the file I've just showed you to side cluster. Uh, as you can see here, it was uploaded complete uh, successfully. And then there are several several options for the way that you want to analyze your data. Uh, the first two here is basically uh, filtering. You can filter by cell count or by percent total. Negative numbers here mean uh, uh, means that you can um, you want to use all the data, but you can very easily increase that to filter your uh, spade nodes by cell count uh, and play with the analysis. Uh, for this particular example, we use negative uh, values because we want to use all the data and not subset them. Um, usually, uh, when we're performing um, the heat map and the hierarchical clustering, we want to transform our data for the numerical values to be stable. Around zero for that, uh, we use the arc sign transformation and the cofactor of five, which is particular for this particular for this uh, experiment. Uh, we're going to select the row medians for, for, from our spade experiments, and then we don't want to include any Disney columns you can also including your population heat map, your Disney uh, columns in that is uh, required for your analysis. Uh, and then by pressing select markers, uh, we have uh, Cytocluster reads in uh, the expression of all the markers for its particular uh, group. And then it presents to the user all the markers that uh, you can do your clustering on. Uh, since our data are uh, gated already, we will exclude some markers here because they're not very meaningful for our particular examples. After having selected the um, the markers that we want to cluster on, uh, pressing go will 
take us to the second step of the cytocluster workflow, which is basically selecting uh, the main group that we want to analyze. For this particular example, we uh, will select the healthy donors and by pressing generate plot, uh, we basically uh, create the population heat map that Saran just explained to you. Uh, it's a heat map where the, its column is the expression of its marker and then the rows represent uh, your spade notes from your spade uh, experiment uh, run in uh, Cytobank. Uh, so you can also configure your heat map uh, in this menu here, you can add plot title. For now, we're going to add HD for healthy donors. And then you can also um, add columns. Uh, it's usually very uh, useful to add the percent total to have an idea about, apart from the expression, have an idea about the, the abundance of its nodes in our data. So these will give us uh, basically, what's the fraction of the cells that uh, are clustered within its uh, spade node. So after having uh, selected the main group, the third step is the node identification. And, and remember, the objective here is to identify Tregs, Treg A and Treg B in particular. So um, Cyber Cluster allows us to select uh, three markers. So we will select the three main markers that Saram talked about, CD25, uh, CD127, and FOXP3. And by pressing go, what Cytocluster does uh, is uh, basically creating a gap heat map where um, the expression of each of these three markers are uh, separated in high, medium, and low based on the Z score of the expression across all the nodes. So this is by checking the distribution and getting a Z score uh, for each particular node. And as you can see, we can already um, identify here that the CD25 high, CD127 low, and FOXP3 high nodes are basically are nodes 98, 99, 80, 93, and 74. So those are our Tregs. Um, and then, of course, by coming here again and clicking Go, you can update your uh, markers to select different subsets. For this particular example, we will use uh, these three. Um, and so having identified uh, these nodes, the next step is to uh, push the, the bubble, so to define them in the spade tree back in Cytobank. For that, we need to come to uh, the node push functionality of uh, Cytocluster. And for that, we just need to uh, identify the nodes and define them, give them a name, and then eventually push them back to uh, Cytobank. I'll do that now. So the first node was 74. And we have node 80, T-Rex as well, 93, and then 98 and 99. Right, so after doing that, we can go back on top of the table and by pressing the push node uh, groups button here, you can uh, basically do what I just explained to so push the bubbles, the spade bubbles back to side of bank. And you get an indication that your spade bubbles have been set. Uh, and then if we go back to side of bank and update our spade tree. we can actually now see that we have defined as T-Rex based on the distribution of the three markers that we've used, uh, these five nodes here, but not the intermediate ones. And the spade bubbles, uh, as expected, is uh, they, they are applied to, to all the groups of the analysis. Uh, right, so um, the 
second objective was to uh, also, apart from, from looking at the T-Regs, uh, we want to identify su even subpopulations of T-Regs. And for that, we can go back to uh, cytoclaster and uh, essentially constantly update our bubbles uh, by uh, defining uh, different uh, markers and checking the Z score and distribution of expression across across the spade tree. Uh, so let's go back to a node identification. And in order to identify T-Reg A and T-Reg B, we need uh, three separate markers, CCR4, CD45RO, and CD95. And then again, if we press go, we will see basically uh, the division of uh, our nodes uh, using the three new markers instead of the three old ones. Uh, and as we can see here, we have uh, three markers here. Uh, so you remember 99, 98, and 80 uh, was three out of five that we have identified before uh, as T-Rex. And we know that um, the nodes that are high for all three of them, they're basically the T-Rex B uh, subset of our um, cells. So going back to the node push, we can update our... Uh, we can update our definition of T-Regs to T-Reg A and T-Reg B. So we have 99, which is T-Reg B, 98, 98 is T-Reg B, 93 is T-Reg A, after looking at the three new markers, and then 80 is T-Reg B, and the last one is 74 which is T rank A. And now if we push the new nodes to Cytobank, our spade tree will be uh, updated. So as, as you can see here, uh, using the three new markings within Cyto cluster, we could identify uh, the two subpopulation of T-Regs. Uh, and we can also check the separation, the spatial separ separation here in the Visney uh, by selecting uh, the Disney dimensions. So as you can see here, uh, T-Reg A, this particular part of the Visney map, T-Reg B, is this part here, so they're specially separated also in the visiting map, uh, the subpopulation of T-Rex that we have identified. Okay, so uh, going back to Cytocluster, as I've said, the first objective was to identify T-Rex and subpopulation of them. The second objective was to um, compare across the three groups of patients or the three examples, the three patients in this particular demo that we have, what happens with the distribution of markers and their expression across all nodes and not only uh, the nodes of T-Regs. So we can do that by going back to the clustering. Uh, so just to remind you this bit, this is basically a heat map that shows expression across the spade tree. We have added here the, uh, the fraction of cells that belong to its node. Uh, and then what we did inside of cluster, we added a second tab here for a second group. So our first, the baseline group is uh, healthy donors. What we can do is go to the fourth group, select the second group that we want to uh, compare with. In this particular example, we can take um, responders. And by pressing the force heat map, what we do, what we do is essentially applying the clustering in our baseline um, uh, group to the, the second group that we want to analyze and compare it with. Uh, as you can see here, if you add in your main group of the analysis, the, the fraction of the cells, this is maintained in the comparison group. And by going here to the heat map configuration, you can uh, 
uh, change the, the font size of the Y and X axis so you, you can make these plots visible and eventually download them and export them uh, for visualization, for presentations, etc. Uh, what I forgot to say is that in each step, what you can do is you can also download the data, which are the matrices behind the uh, the heat map, it's heat map. So you get the normalized data and you can perform statistical tests depending on your uh, analysis needs. Uh, right, so um, for now we can go to the heat map configuration and include a title so we know what we are comparing with our healthy donors by clicking the update plot. Basically, you update only the second heat maps in this the second heat map in this particular tab, and uh, so uh, the first step would be to look at the heat maps and identify parts of the heat maps that are different in these two um, uh, conditions. Basically, in our demo, you can already see that there is difference in CD seven. Uh, there's uh, higher expression here, lower expression here. Uh, and to facilitate this process, what we did again with inside our cluster is adding uh, another functional functionality apart from the visual inspection of the two groups. Uh, what we can do is basically uh, overlay groups. That's the third tab in this particular part of CIDR cluster. Uh, and what the application does here, it takes some seconds to do that. Uh, basically, it overlays the two heat maps and calculate the difference across the two heat maps. So it's basically subtracting from the baseline uh, population or the baseline condition, the one that you're comparing uh, and you're looking to uh, see the expression across different markers. So uh, then you get uh, a third heat map and the association fraction or the associated fraction of cells here, which is basically the, uh, as I said, the subtraction of the values of the second heat map from the first one. So whatever is positive, it's higher in your baseline uh, group. Whatever is negative, it's higher in your um, in the condition in the second group that you're comparing with. And as you can see here, we could um, so the uh, those on the bot uh, the bottom they are basically our T reg uh, spade nodes. 98, 99, 80, 74, and 93. As you can you can see by directly looking at these two heat maps, which is what we had in the in the previous step, you can already see some uh, difference in the expression here, uh, which is also visualized in the uh, in the overlay heat map here, which is the difference. And also by looking across markers and across nodes, so not concentrating on particular. Uh, Mark is you can you can see that there is also no 25 for example which is quite different between the two conditions and there are also some nodes that you can identify differences in the fraction so increase or decrease of the cells that belong to these two uh, to to these particular nodes uh, that you have here for example 40 or 42 or 13. Uh, there is an increase in the, in the number of cells that it's in this particular node. Uh, so just to finish, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, you can uh, always in every single step of the CIDR cluster, and we do that, we do that on purpose because we, uh, of course, in every analysis, you will need to uh, perform some statistical tests, probably some further plotting outside CIDR cluster. What you can always do is uh, download the data by clicking uh, this button and get the numerical values, either uh, the differences behind the overlay heat map here or in the other in the other tabs, the individual tables behind the, uh, the baseline heat map or the, the comparison heat map so you can perform your downstream analysis after side of cluster. And with that, uh, I'll hand over to Saram for the summary slide. All right. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, so I, before I finish, I just want to say that, uh, of course, uh, we use T-Regs as an example today to show you uh, basically uh, how you can use this package to identify T-Regs. But 
this is not just for T-Rex, obviously you can use it for uh, any other population, whether the conventional and known population or to identify new population which are perhaps in your experiment or in patient sample, etc. So to summarize, uh, the steps are basically four steps that uh, uh, you've seen an example of it and how you identify the population. And I hope I convinced you and we convinced you that T-Rex populations that define this way are more robust. Uh, it's a more robust definition. They are comparable between the studies. And it provides, of course, we're not saying these, these are the two subtypes of T-Rex and there is no other T-Rex. Uh, this is an umbrella for identifying further subpopulations by in different conditions or different diseases. Uh, I hope um, this was uh, helpful and we are uh, ready for question. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, uh, Sharon and Thanos, for sharing your story with us all today. Um, this now opens up our live Q&A portion of the webinar. I uh, just want to remind you all, so you, a few of you have already submitted some questions. Um, just want to remind everyone else to please, as you have questions, uh, write them into the Q&A, and now is the time to answer them. And then also, if we don't get to your questions, you have questions about Cytobank, please visit our support portal um, to actually access the tool that was demoed today. Uh, visit GitHub here. And then if we don't have the opportunity to answer all of your cytocluster specific questions, please contact Thanos at this email address. And um, one last housekeeping item. Uh, Sharon mentioned a previous webinar. Uh, this link here will take you to our different webinar recordings. And so uh, this is the webinar Bench to Bytes. Uh, you guys can view that webinar for details behind the data in today's, uh, from today's demo. And with that, we will now open the floor for your questions. Okay, so this question is for Shram Thanos. Um, he said, very interesting, and are curious when you guys made your spade tree, how did you determine that you had enough spade nodes to fully define the different Treg populations? All right, uh, that's a very uh, interesting question. Um, okay, the first thing is, this is based on uh, when you don't know, as a, as a general rule, it's better to do over-clustering. So the maximum number you could do, or basically something that um, predefined, for instance, in uh, Cytobank is 200, I believe. Uh, something that it's over-clustered, more than what you expect. And of course, later on, what you could do, you could merge those nodes that are more or less similar to each other, and limit to a number and optimize the number that it's um, uh, enough. Uh, based on several different analysis that we did in past few years, and because the focus of my lab is very much uh, CD4 T cells, uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, uh, optimum number for CD4 T cells in human, uh, we reached a number of 75, for instance. Very much this depends on population you are interested. There are methods, of course, to guess what are uh, the numbers, the best numbers. But uh, as a general uh, suggestion, perhaps, I don't know, Thanos, what you think, but uh, as a general rule, overclustering is always good. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree. Uh, I mean, you can go as far as you want, and then eventually, as Ram just mentioned, you will merge nodes which is why we do all these heat map and try to identify different nodes that correspond to the same cell subset. So uh, yeah, overclustering at this stage, at least in the exploratory analysis, it's a, I think it's a good way to go and then eventually defining your, your, the best number of classes that you can have for your particular data set. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I'd add to, we've done um, at Cytobank a bit of work internally on this question and we found over clustering with spade works well and that generally, you know, if you kind of estimate depending on your data set, 
we think there's 20 different biologically relevant subsets, whatever that number is, that starting clustering with, you know, six to seven times more nodes than whatever is your final biological number of subsets tends to be a good place to start. Right. All right. So this next question here asks, this one's also for Thanos and Sharam. Have you guys analyzed the purity of the designated Treg nodes using biaxial gating? Uh, that's a very easy thing to do. Uh, basically, I think uh, you've noticed when uh, Thanos was showing the nodes that you're selecting, obviously at the same time, in Cytobank you can uh, look at actually where they are based on the two specific markers that you identify. You can easily do that. Uh, uh, so that is that is uh, kind of very quick way of doing it. The other option is obviously when you are, find a bubble and uh, that bubble is on your uh, uh, spade uh, tree, you can always export it to a new uh, experiment, export the FCS file, use the other tools that you may have uh, and look and check. Yeah, so the, is this possible? And yes, we did that. Uh, and actually based on the markers that define this population, we sorted this subpopulation. We looked at the RNA-seq, we looked at the function of them, the cytokine profile, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and so I think that you know, just the only thing to add, you can absolutely do that and use biaxial gating. And the great thing is demo today is cytoclusters interacting with cytobank. So all that data is then there for you to biaxial gate or pull the statistics for further analyses. Um, okay, so this next one's I think just a general question maybe directed and I can field this one. Um, is Cytocluster the first tool that offers auto-gating from Cytobank? Um, so I guess if, if you mean auto-gating as just a way to, uh, without sort of human uh, subjectivity coming in and uh, partitioning your data, um, this is certainly a tool that can accomplish that as demonstrated today. Um, of note, we do, um, as far as clustering options in Cytobank, you know, speed is one of them. You can manually gate yourself. We have tools for that. And then coming very soon, we are going to have FlowSum available on Cytobank. Um, so if any of you guys are, for, are interested in that, we're actually opening the beta testing in the next week or so for FlowSum. So um, feel free to contact us. Our support, and we can sign you up for that. Uh, but uh, can I can I just add one uh, small thing on that? Uh, as uh, Hannah mentioned, uh, this is not an automated gating uh, tool. Uh, we don't consider that. I think is uh, is not really gating your population. You 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 use to identify your population, but necessarily gate as we know in cytometry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think you guys, as you were showing, the idea is just kind of it's partitioning and doing that extra ex exploration Correct. too, like looking at the heat heat map clusters. Correct. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let's see. We maybe have time for one more question. Um, Let's do this one here. Can you use this approach to explore small and rare subsets um, other than the ones that were shown today? Um, yeah, I think Sharam even mentioned that uh, that this was you were showing Treg subsets as an example, but that you could certainly use a similar approach to identify other rare yeah. subsets. Um, the, there are. Uh, Adam, there are do you have anything to add? There are two aspects to that. Number one is that you know the population you are interested, and those are the one uh, that is, uh, you know how you define them. The, the, the classic populations like maybe T Rex, T effectors, etc., uh, that you can use these tools to identify them within your population. 
that's one approach. Which is why we added the second step, right, with the three markets at the moment, and then, yeah, we hope to increase it, but uh, then you have the gap heat map, so you're looking for things that you know, essentially. Right. But sometimes you want to keep your mind open and look at everything in a way that you want to see what are the difference between sample group A versus B, are there the clusters that either frequency or expressions are different? And you just, just keep your mind open, uh, you compare the two, and you identify cluster that by number or expression are different. And then you can go back to your uh, data and see later on, you can do 2D, uh, 2D analysis, etc., to see what are they. So a even more unbiased approach, if you like. And that is another possibility to use this tool. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thank you. Well, we are at time for our webinar. Um, there are a few of you that if we didn't answer your question live, we'll follow up with you individually. Um, otherwise, as you can see from this slide, uh, there's contact information to uh, send us additional questions. And thank you so much Strong Thanos for joining us and for sharing your developing and sharing the tool with us all. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you everyone for participating. Yes, thanks for the wonderful questions. Have a great day, everyone.